Hey friends, it's Ian. It's time for Bible Teaching Tuesday. Uh, last Sunday, we uh, moved into another epistle for our summer readings. I say this a lot, so I hope you don't tire of it, but anytime you see green on the altar, Epiphany, or uh, during this long season of Pentecost, most of summer and fall, um, the epistle readings, that middle reading on Sunday morning, doesn't necessarily coincide with anything in the Old Testament reading or the gospel reading. During the other times of the year, uh, the epistle is especially selected to have a similar theme or tie into those, but during these green seasons when the church is supposed to be growing, we just sort of systematically work through different books of the Bible. So this summer so far, uh, we read through most of Paul's letter to Galatians on Sunday morning in early summer, uh, last week, we, we transitioned into Colossians, and we'll be in that for the next several weeks. So uh, it's kind of nice, you know, if you're looking for something to study or focus on, um, these can be good indicators, you know, maybe you plow into Colossians for the next month or two of your life or get a book on it or something. Uh, anyway, uh, I actually preached on the introduction to Colossians last week. Uh, so this section today comes right after that. Um, uh, verses, I believe, uh, 21 through 29, and, I, and I'm going to look just prior to that, um, Colossians 1, 19 and 20. Uh, huge, huge, important theology here. Uh, this is Bible Teaching Tuesday, and uh, here before our eyes is one of the most important teachings, well, the most important teaching uh, of Scripture, uh, and it's on the left-hand side there, verse 19, For in him, that is Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That means Jesus is fully divine, right? Um, the disciples knew that. Peter confessed him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Um, the early church always recognized the divinity of Jesus. Uh, the trouble was, how does this fit with one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? And uh, this is the early church is developing this understanding of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God and three persons. Um, but there was a huge temptation in order to protect monotheism, one God, to diminish the divinity of the Son. And nowhere was this more promulgated than by a man named Arius, who said um, basically that Jesus was not fully God. It's a far more sophisticated argument. And I don't think he was trying to be a heretic necessarily, um, but he pushed too far in one direction, and the church had to speak against Arius, and they did so primarily in the Nicene Creed, uh, that he's, Jesus is true God, uh, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, there's no time when he was not, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. So those words were penned specifically to uphold the church's teaching that, as Colossians 1.19 clearly says, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Um, he's not somehow lesser than the Father with respect to his divinity. And that's good news, because he's come to save the world, and mere human blood shed uh, would not atone for the sins of the world, but because he is fully divine, uh, look what happens. And through him, that is Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether in heaven and earth. So uh, God sends Jesus and places in him his, or who, who, who is fully divine, I guess, is a better way to say that. And Jesus reconciles the whole world back to the Father. And then you see on the right there, making peace by the blood of his cross. So Jesus shedding his blood, his innocent blood, his divine blood on the cross makes peace between God the Father and humanity. Many theologians over the ages have tried to explain this. How is this possible? Is the blood somehow a payment for the debt we owe? Um, all kinds of analogies abound, and they're all trying to get at this mystery. And and some of them are helpful to think through, but none of them can fully capture the mystery of what it was when the Son of God, God in the flesh, died for the sins of humankind. We don't understand how or why that atones for the sins of the world. We just trust that it does, that through Jesus' blood, we have peace through the blood of the cross. 
we have peace with our Father in heaven. And that's the promise we live in each and every day. It's a wonderful promise. It's a great Bible teaching Tuesday. So that's it for me this week. We'll see you next week uh, with whatever I'm assigned and God's peace to you.